Security Measures on XLR Network One of the primary concerns in the blockchain ecosystem is security. People are naturally concerned about the money in their pockets, particularly those floating around on the blockchain. In the case of XLR, several protocols are utilized. The basic measures used in almost every single step are Cryptographic Threshold Signature Scheme or TSS. It is supported by the consensus of Delegated Proof of Stake. We will investigate in depth how these measures can keep us safe. Let's consider a normal operation using Axelar Network. When a user wants to transfer an asset across chains, for example, threshold wallets are set up on both source and destination chains. As funds are added onto the source chain wallet, the user wants to withdraw funds from the destination chain wallet, but the funds are currently locked for security purposes. The decision to validate the action of unlocking and withdrawing funds lies on the Axelar network. However, some of the personals or validators on the network might collude to unlock and withdraw funds to their own wallet. As a result, a security measure should be in place to prevent this from happening, which is where threshold signature schemes come in. To understand how the schemes work, we must first review some fundamental cryptographic concepts. To fully grasp the threshold signature schemes, allow me to refresh your memory on public key cryptography. It is intended to address the following issue. Assume there are two people, XL and Eller. XL wishes to convey a message to Eller via an unsecure channel where anyone can listen in on all messages broadcasted. Two issues arise. One, the message content may leak to anyone who pick up on the broadcast and that person may use the knowledge for some unfair advantages. And two, the receiver, Ella in this case, is unsure if the origin of the message is indeed from the intended sender or AXO. In short, the information might leak and it's difficult to validate the identity of the sender. Several steps in the protocols to solve this conundrum involve functions. So let me clarify what that is quickly. A function is analogous to a machine that accepts one or more inputs, performs some action on it, and yields an output. Consider a rice cooker for example. When rice and water are placed in the cooker, the machine performs an action, which is in this case cooking, and produce a cooked rice as the output. Some functions may only accept one input. For example, when a cold soup is placed in a microwave, a hot soup is produced as a result. Some functions are reversible. It doesn't mean that we can reverse the product back into the input though. In fact, it means that we can deduce the input from the output. For example, if we see a bowl of cooked brown rice emerge from the rice cooker, we know that the input must have been the brown rice and water. Some functions, on the other hand, are irreversible, or we cannot predict what the input is based on the output. For example, if you see a hot soup coming out of a machine, it could be a reheat of an already made soup. Or the input could be an ingredient such as broth, carrot, or onion combined. In this particular example, we can sort of guess what the input is based on the output, even though we, we can't pinpoint the exact input. In practice, however, if the function is truly irreversible, we have no idea what the input is from the output. This type of function is extremely useful in the blockchain-based cryptographic protocol. Many well-known functions like RSA, which relies on prime numbers, or ECC, which utilize an elliptical curve, are irreversible. You can imagine these names as the brands of the machine. 
Bitcoin and Ethereum use ECC in their encryption process. The details of RSA and ECC are worth another episode, so we will skip over them for now. These functions are crucial since the underlying principle of public key cryptography is that they are truly irreversible. Let's get back to the issue at hand. Axel and Ella each have a private key or secret key, which is a long string of numbers that is, as the name suggested, supposedly known only to the owner. Each person generates a public key by running his or her private key through an irreversible function. Because the function is irreversible, knowing the public key is useless for recovering the private key. As a result, Axel and Ella can safely reveal their public key to the rest of the world. You can think of the public key as a manual or set of instructions. Because it is a safe knowledge to share with anyone, the public key or the manual can be thought of as being stored in a library where anyone can check it out. Because the process is only possible in one direction or irreversible, this key generation is sometimes referred to as asymmetric. In short, each person has two keys that are asymmetrically linked. A public key that is known to everyone and a private key that only the owner knows. Let's see how the previous issue can be resolved. The first problem is the message encryption. Axel takes Ella public key which everyone knows and insert it into a function with his message. It's like Axel uses Ella instruction to encrypt the message. The result will be an encrypted message which looks gibberish to naked eyes. Keep in mind that Axel function requires two inputs, the destination public key and the message itself. If Axel alters the message content, the encrypted message will be changed as well. The message will be sent to the receiver, Ella. When Ella receives the message, she puts the encrypted message into another function with her private key. The output will be the translated message. For someone who might intercept the message along the way, without the private key, the decryption would be impossible. The second issue is one of identity. How does the receiver know that the message came from the sender? To put it simply, the sender must sign the message with an unforgeable signature. So Axel enters his private key as well as the message into a function. The result is analogous to a message with a signature at the bottom. The signed message cannot be used to retrieve the private key because the function used is irreversible. On receiving ends, Ella applies the signed message and Axel's public key into a function. The function on the machine will return true or false to validate the signature. If the outcome is true, Ella will know that the message was indeed sent by the intended sender. This approach is more secure than the real-world analogy. In most cases, a person signs roughly the same way in all scenarios and for all messages. However, in this case, the signature itself will change depending on the message. It's like a person changes his signature slightly every time. For example, he might include an extra lube here or spin a bit more there, but the signature's validity can still be verified. The second solution, digital signatures, will be the primary topic we will discuss further. Aside from validating the sender of a message, 
digital signatures can be used in a variety of other ways. For example, if Axel wants to send some tokens to Ella, he needs a way to authorize this action that only Axel can perform. So for example, Axel go to his vault, go to his wallet and say, okay, I want to withdraw the fund. I want to send to Ella. So he has to prove that he is indeed Axel. So he's going to say that, okay, that is my signature, approve it. On the other hand, if the authorization of token transfer from Axel to Ella can be forged, Ella would gladly repeat this action over and over without the consent of Axel. So in this case, Ella forged the signature and say, keep transferring the token to me. In the end, the idea of unforgeable validation of identity or authorization give rise to the term signature in the context of the threshold signature scheme. Let's look at another example. What if Axel wants to take the money out of his wallet to do whatever he wants to? He must first grant permission for the funds to be withdrawn. He must prove that he is the rightful owner of the wallet. In a simplified explanation, he simply inserted his private key into the vault's lock. The vault is another analogy for the public key. However, the process of allowing the fund to be withdrawn is a little bit more complicated than simply inserting the key into the lock. To authorize the action, Axel must sign the message with his private key. Axel's public key is used to validate the signed message. If the light turns green, the action is completed. Because the actual process is a little bit lengthy, I will refer to unlocking the vault as an analogy for the process of digitally signing the message from now on. To summarize, public key cryptography or PKC can be divided into three steps. Key generation is the process of generating the corresponding pair of a public key and a private key. Two, signing. The sender sign the message using his private key. Three, verification. The receiver verify the signatures by using the sender's public key. Everything appears to be in order. However, there is a major issue. The process has a single point of failure, which means that if this point breaks, the entire process fails. This vulnerable point is the private key. The public key encryption relies on the fact that the private key is indeed private and secret. This added a significant burden and pressure to the task of keeping the key safe. This doesn't make a lot of sense. It's as if you are using a toothpick to support a table full of expensive yet delicate glassware. A single failure results in a disaster. Having a single private key that ultimately controls the identity might work if the identity is of a single person. He is solely responsible for his wallet. But what if we have a large organization's treasury with millions of dollars at stake? Who will own the private key? In other words, who would we put our trust in, given that only that person will be able to unlock and withdraw the fund? In the world of decentralization, we should not rely on trust. Duplicating the key and distributing it to multiple people would be ineffective because each key can act independently. Worse, it increases the likelihood of the key being stolen. That is why multi-party computation or MPC is useful to improve security. MPC is a protocol in which multiple parties who do not trust each other attempt to perform a function by accumulating inputs from each other while keeping those inputs private. For example, at one school, there is a school-wide test. Everyone is informed of his or her score but is unaware of the scores of others. 
What if there is a task to find the highest score received by any student? So for example, these are the students with the amount of score that they get. Each student only know his or her score, but they don't know of one another. So what do they need to do? They just simply need to enter their own score into a machine. And the machine or the function returns the maximum value, which is 90 in this case. As you notice, the student never needs to tell everyone what is his or her score. Hence, as demonstrated, we can complete the task without leaking a single score during the computation. When designing an MPC, two critical properties must be met. Correctness. The output of the function is correct. In this case, the given answer is indeed the highest score obtained by any student. Privacy Each party input is kept private and will not be disclosed to the other parties. In this case, each student remains unaware of the scores of their classmates. But how can multi-party computation be applied to the public key cryptography? Let's consider it step by step. Key generation. This is most likely the most challenging step to complete. A private key will be split into several pieces and distributed to multiple parties. Thus, this step is known as distributed key generation. Each party can generate the same public key using only a portion of the private key. In fact, there are numerous ways to complete this step which we will discuss in details later. The second step, signing. Each party input is fed into a function along with the message. The output will be the sign message, which should look exactly like the sign message obtained by using a single private key. The system can be configured so that all parties must be present at the same time, just as all key must be turned at the same time. Alternatively, each party can sign it independently in his or her own time, and the machine will only work when all the keys have been turned. The burden on the corresponding party will be reduced as a result. Third step, verification. There is no change here. The receiver validates the signature using the sender's public key as usual. Threshold signature scheme is the further modification of multi-party computation. The number of fragments of private key produced in distributed key generation exceeds the actual number used. This means that in the signing process, only a subset of the parties were required to be present for the signature to be valid. This is referred to as the threshold level. For Acceler, this portion is two-thirds which means that for the signing process to be completed, at least two-thirds of the party must enter their fragmented private key into the function. So in this example, there are six parties, two-thirds of it would be four. So at least four is needed, or even if we don't have the last two, this function still works. Certainly, it is not as secure as requiring all parties to be present, which is time-consuming, but at the very least, a single party or small group cannot collude to forge the signature. On the other hand, new technology always carries the risk of not having been battle tested. There could be a way to break the system that not even the security designer has thought of. Or with the help of even more advanced technology, hackers can render the security system obsolete. The usage of multi-party computation to split the private key and share it among several people is great. Not only that it decreases the burden of responsibility on each person, but it also increases security. There are many adaptations to the idea and we shall explore the benefits and pitfalls of each one, including the multi-sig, secret sharing scheme, and the threshold signature. For the first one, Multi-sig or multi-signature increases the security by multiplying the number of locks and assigning the keys to multiple parties. 
So for example, here you can see that we produce six different keys, but the vote that we create also contains six different locks instead of just one. The account or the vault guarded by the multi-sig contains several locks and requires several keys to unlock. The mechanism can also be equipped with a threshold concept where only some portion of these keys is required to open the vault. For example, even though there are six keys and six locks, maybe only three are needed to unlock it. That of course is a threshold level. However, the extra number of locks makes the vault itself heavy or requires lots of fees to operate. Moreover, this extra security makes it stand out, attracting attention from unwanted visitors. The interaction with this special vault would be bulky and easy to track as well. In short, the good part is that it improves the security, especially if each private key is properly kept separately. On the other hand, it incurs higher fees. It stands out too much and it's less private. Just like this vault, as if like there is like a siren say like, look at me, and it's very heavy as well. The second adaptation is Shamir Secret Sharing Schemes. It increases security by separate the key into multiple fragments. Only when those fragments are reassembled does a working key emerge. It only can be done so that only a portion of the key fragments are required to create a working key. In this case, the vault will have only one lock, giving it the appearance of a regular vault and avoiding unwanted attention. However, a significant drawback is that the key becomes full and functioning on two occasions. To begin, when the key is generated, it will be in one piece and handled by a single party known as the dealer, who will be in charge of breaking and distributing fragments to various parties. The second point is when the private key fragments are reassembled. This allows the hacker the opportunity to steal the fully functional key. So in short, the Shamir Secret Sharing Scheme or SSSS keep the transaction fee the same and the vault private because from the outside, it appears to be a regular vault with a single lock. However, there are some points where the key is functioning, making it susceptible to hackers. The last one is the best one and it's the one that Axela uses, the threshold signature scheme. It addresses the shortcomings of the previous two methods. All the key fragments are always separated and never meet one another. In the key generation process, the outcome are the fragmented keys that are assigned to multiple parties. The vault still has one lock, which makes it indistinguishable from a standard one. The trick is in the mechanism behind the lock, which is known as a modular lock. Consider unlocking a standard key and lock insert a key and turn in a single action. However, in the case of a modular lock, each key from each party can only turn the lock a small amount. Thus, a certain number of keys are required to fully turn the lock. That number is the threshold, or as shown in here, four keys are needed to turn these four different steps. In conclusion, TSS is secure because the keys never come into contact with each other and the modular lock is indistinguishable from the outside, attracting less attention. However, due to the interactive nature of the modular lock signing process, all parties must be present during the action. This means that the number of validators on the Accelerator network that are operational at the same time must be greater than a certain threshold value. And that is why there is a protocol in place to maintain uptime for each validator and penalize those who are unable to operate to keep the Axela network functioning properly. In the case of Axela, they also make this scheme even more secure because the key that are assigning to each party will be rotated periodically as well, meaning that we're gonna give it the time elements to the hackers. So the hackers 
just doesn't need to be able to hack a certain number of validators. They need to be able to achieve those number in a certain amount of time as well. And that significantly reduces the risk of the Axelon network being hijacked. I hope that after all of this, it makes you feel safer to trust Axelon network to transfer your fund from one chain to another chain. But one problem still remains. Who are these parties? Who are these validators and how do we control them and keep it fair? That's going to come next in the case of the delegated proof of stake.